This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good morning and aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov, and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. And today, our program is titled Law and Politics. And my guest is a lawyer who came across the sea from the East Coast to Hawaii, and then he's traveled back and forth all over Asia Pacific, across the sea and back to Hawaii. And my guest is Peter Carlisle. Peter is a Hawaii attorney. For most of his professional life, he's been in the public spotlight. He served as prosecuting attorney of the city and county of Honolulu and mayor of Honolulu. Peter is presently in private law practice, but he still has an interest in politics and law, or, and that's why I've asked him here. I've asked him to talk a little bit about it. Uh, while he was a prosecuting attorney, Peter personally prosecuted high-profile cases and advocated for tougher sentencing laws. As mayor, he supported rail transit and promoted Honolulu as an Asia-Pacific business center. I want to ask him about his experience and his knowledge in those serious topics and what he sees presently in Honolulu and what he sees for the future. But first, welcome, Peter. Good, Mark, good to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, we've known each other for years and years, <laughs> as you pointed out. And uh, yes, I invaded the islands from the East Coast, uh, having stopped first in Kent, Connecticut for high school, then University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill for uh, uh, for undergraduate school, and then finally law school at UCLA. Wow, and you made your way across the continent and over here to Hawaii. I did with a lot of enthusiasm by the time I arrived here, because I'd been here before and decided that I needed to come back and stay. Okay, okay, I want to get to that in a minute. But first of all, before we get into all the serious talk, okay, you were prosecuting attorney. Yes. You were the mayor yes. of, of, of our city. Both really serious jobs, Peter. Yes. A lot of serious topics. Definitely. But before we get into those, was there any fun or humor in those jobs? I mean, was there anything that, that made it in, you know, enjoyable or gave you a, a laugh? If you didn't have humor in that job, you would go crazy <laughs> in about 20 minutes. So there were all sorts of interesting things that happened in, in the hallways of the courthouse. Uh, in the accusations pointed at me by some of the people who weren't <laughs> happy with me. Uh, and I took great joy and uh, enthusiasm and happiness if I made somebody's life really miserable, like a criminal <laughs> or a defense attorney who wanted me to give them a deal. It made me all the better. <laughs> I see. So the job itself w was fun, is what you're telling the me. The job was fun because okay. it, it's, it's absolutely intense for periods, but then there are lulls uh, which you can sort of sit back and relax and enjoy. And, uh, being mayor, a lot of people will treat you very, very well, uh, whether they like you or not. Uh, and they think that's going to get them somewhere, which unfortunately for them, it didn't. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it, it really can have uh, very, very interesting things happen. I once had a, a guy in the courtroom who had done something wrong, and I was, tr I was trying to put him in jail. And I sat there. I wanted to have his bond revoked. And so I kept on saying, and I said, you know, he's done this, he's done this, like this. And he got tired of it. So he turned over to me and he said, hey, you're an SOB. Got up and ran out of the courtroom <laughs> with two, two people following after him who had guns and handcuffs. And he came back in with a lot less freedom than he had when he, had when he was running away. All right. So those type of episodes add to the, 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 the joy of the job. Well, it's, it's, it's entertaining, yeah, uh, you yeah, know. Yeah. And for me... Uh, I always enjoyed being a prosecutor because... Uh, well, well, wait, what, what is a prosecutor? That's, prosecutor that's is the person who enforces the laws of the city and county of Honolulu and the state of Hawaii. Okay. And it's the person who, if somebody robs a bank, uh, you, they're arrested, the police do all the investigation, and then on our side, it's our job to convict the person and see to it that they're sentencing okay. and then deal with the appellate matters as well. Okay, I, I, I interrupted you. You were talking about cases that you'd handle. I know you handled some heavy-duty cases, murder cases, that type of cases. And, yeah. uh, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, how do you deal with the stress of those cases and the, 
and the, and the concern and the worry about who you're dealing with? How, how does that? I think a lot of it has to do with practice. Uh, you know, you can't buy a jury trial these days in, uh, in the legal profession, except if you're a public defender or you're a prosecutor. And I always knew that the bad guy was the bad guy and uh, never really felt particularly sympathetic for the worst of them. Now, there are other people who you find they make mistakes and uh, there is at least a potential for rehabilitation. That's weighed into the equation as well. But uh, frankly, when you're dealing with people who are uh, mass murderers, uh, if you deal with people who are molesting small children, uh, those type of people, you really get your pleasure by putting them in jail. So it, it never, it, it, there wasn't a stress, there was an energy to do it for you in, in, in that sense. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Am yeah. I right to characterize yeah. that? Well, there, I mean, there is a stress because, you yeah. know, I mean, if the cameras are blazing at you and you're trying to put somebody who's horrible and the community is infuriated at uh, for all the right reasons, then, uh, yeah, there's a stress to make sure that you go through. And, you know, and the, a courtroom is a very fluid situation. I mean, you can never tell from point A to point B uh, what's going to be happening in the next 30 or 40 minutes. So you have to be pretty much an on your foot sort of guy. You have to be on your feet. Yeah, so at any moment things can change in the courtroom and, and you've got to be just aware of that and be able to, to move, move with whatever happens is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. and it, it varies from time to time. I mean, there are some, some people who treated uh, prosecutors very fairly and there are some people who uh, are on the appellate courts or who are judges who uh, don't do anything for the prosecutor whatsoever, if anything, they get in the way. And uh, those people are frustrating and aggravating, but the good news is, is that you make them just as angry <laughs> at you as they, you are at them. And of course, you, you have to deal with defense counsel, and some of them are? Some are, but you know, the, the, by the vast majority of defense counsel do a, a, an honorable job. Mm -hmm. I mean, there has to be a defense. It has to be yeah. an adver adversary system. And uh, in general, there aren't a whole lot of people who are intentionally doing things that are uh, unethical and they stick to the code. Now that's not true for all of them. I know we've had defense attorneys who've gone to jail on occasion. Mm -hmm. We've had a, a few prosecutors on occasion that have gone to jail. But as a matter of fact, very, very small percentage. Uh, it's hard for them to get off that white charging horse and take all that armor off. So, uh, but there, it's, it's a rare occurrence for that to occur. You, you know, you, you mentioned that um, sometimes uh, there are people that don't intend to do bad things, and they do them. And then there's some people that are just, you, you, I can tell, you feel they're, there's no hope. They're inherently bad. In Hawaii, uh, let's say... They're bad, but they have a completely different point of view. I mean, if you're in a courtroom and you're a prosecutor, and uh, you're not just fighting the defense attorney, you're fighting the judge as well, uh, that's not a good situation. Mm. Okay, okay. Now, in, in, when, when, you were, when you were the prosecutor, what... what Time period was that? That was. Uh, well, I started as a line guy in '78. For 10 years, I was a, a line prosecutor, which means I wasn't in charge. Uh, then I think it was about 10 years later that uh, I ended up being elevated to the elected prosecuting attorney. I was the third elected prosecuting attorney in Honolulu, and then. Uh, so I think the entire period was about a quarter of a century. <laughs> okay, well. Uh, during that period of time, Peter, did we have organized crime in Hawaii? What, what, is there such a thing? I mean, what, what is organized crime? Do we have it? Did we have it then? Do we have it now? What do we do about it? Well, organized crime depends, again, on how you define it. But yes, uh, you know, I mean, two, more, two people who can organize a conspiracy, uh, you could call that organized crime. I tend to look at it as a sort of a more uh, expansive uh, organization uh, that is out to uh, create havoc in the, the world. People who have organized crime, the Yakuza, those are the types of people you have to worry about. Some of the drug cartel people you have to worry about. Uh, those people are what, in my opinion, are organized criminals. And we had the Yakuza here during your term as yes. prosecutor. I, I mean, I, I know that personally. I've seen it. Uh, drug cartels, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of, but I suspect that there are uh, some it, involved it, it here. It takes somebody to bring the crystal methamphetamine over here. Mm -hmm. We had uh, issues with places like North Korea, for one, and others that actually uh, sent uh, 
the methamphetamine over here. Now it, it's across the border in Mexico. Uh, and then there was also a period when I think it was called Batu. It was brought over from uh, the Philippines. And how, how do we deal with it? It's a prosecutor. How, do, how? I mean, have we dealt with it? Is it? it can we ever get rid of it? You Is can. There... You can. You can make progress. It, it, it's never really gone completely away. And there are always people who are using uh, various means to try and have some advantage in the criminal empire. Uh, but uh, no, it's never completely gone away. It's, it's like, uh, I mean, it's like the common cold. Uh, it's never gone away. Uh, it's always there. And uh, then sometimes it's exacerbated so that you have pneumonia and then you get up to the period where uh, either it's life-threatening or it's an organization. Their, their entire effort and goal is to uh, profit from criminal activities. It's all about money. It's all about money. It's all about money then making well, money. Well, except when it's all about money, then it's also on occasion these guys get mad at each other. It's also power. So if somebody ego. wants to be, yeah, power and ego, is, that's a better way of putting it. Uh, yeah, that, that's absolutely true. I mean, they want to rise to the top. They want to be known as the kingpin. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, they get there, and then somebody else decides that they want to be able to step in and do that. You know, Escobar, those kinds of people were all uh, had billion-dollar empires before a billion dollars wasn't quite as much, uh, was a lot more money than it is right now, and, and didn't pay taxes. Yeah, uh, and they won't be affected by the new tax law at all? I don't all. think so. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier that sometimes prosecutors get in trouble and have been in jail, too. Yeah. And, so as a, as a prosecutor, as the head prosecutor, how do you deal with that in your office? I mean, how do you practically deal with that when a prosecutor is accused of something or is, is in trouble or even gets convicted? How do you deal with that? Uh, you know, I don't recall one during my watch. Uh, but then again, Doug Chin was, you know, also with me on my watch. And he was, you know, watching out for it carefully and making sure that those types of things didn't go on. But if you found somebody who had done something highly unethical, and there's some people who will do that kind of thing, uh, then it is your job to turn them in, and your job is to see that they are appropriately handled by somebody where there's no conflict of interest, and uh, make sure that they are given their just desserts, which if it means disciplinary action, then it's disciplinary action. And if you're told by the disciplinary council this person needs to be released, which I don't believe they ever did to me but uh, or asked me to, uh, I would have followed their advice. Okay, okay. Now, at some point in time, you decided you might want to try to become mayor, get involved in the politics of downtown Honolulu. A very weak moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well tell, tell us what, what happened. How did, you, how did you decide to get into politics? How did you decide to run for mayor? What, what spurred you on to do that? I had spent... Uh, really quite a long time uh, as the prosecutor. And I had gotten to the point where the office was running itself very smoothly, uh, in large part by Doug, but also uh, because we had made sure that through the process of uh, evolution in the office, we had good people who knew what they were doing. And so I really had become less necessary, uh, and I had had the, the pleasure of trying uh, as you said, very high profile, very significant cases. Uh, and it had gotten to that point where it was time for me to go and let the office continue uh, in the hands of somebody who I could trust to be able to do it. Uh, Don Picaro was somebody who I could trust to do it. Uh, with Doug being there, it would have been also very easy for it to carry on in the appropriate manner. So uh, that was when I decided it was time to uh, take a look and the next logical place to go was in the city because I was a city being uh, for my entire career at that point. Okay, all right. Now, during your term as mayor, you uh, were in favor of rail transit. It was all about rail, rail, rail. It's well, still it was, about yeah, rail, yeah. rail, rail, rail. Well, all right. In, in the few seconds right now, tell us, how are we gonna solve this rail problem? What do we do, what can we do based on your experience as mayor. Finish the job. Finish the job. You, you've got to finish the job, and frankly, that's what I was advocating for ever since I got into it. And the person who absolutely gave me the greatest guidance in that regard was a gentleman by the name of Dan Inouye. 
And Dan Inouye was a huge advocate for rail, and uh, he wanted to make sure that this was going to be his uh, gift that he left for posterity as his last great public works. Mm. And it's a huge public works. It's cost all sorts of money. There have been cost overruns from start to finish. And the reason for that is Randy Roth, Ben Cayetano, and Cliff Slater, period. <laughs> Do you want to explain that, or is that? Well, is they're that the people who put on, put all the the, the legal blockage barriers, in the way, yeah. the barriers one after another after another. And anybody who has any knowledge of the construction industry knows that if you start slowing things down, then costs rise, schedules aren't kept, and there's a whole series of new problems. So this did not have to be this expensive. It was made that expensive for people who were stuck to last century type thinking, and they succeeded in costing everybody a whole lot of money. The delay, the delay, delay, delay. Delay, delay, delay. It's, and you know, and it's, you know, they do that in, uh, in civil cases and in criminal cases, too. Delay is, is basically uh, puts the pocket in the, the law, puts money in the lawyer's pocket and doesn't get the case resolved. Well, of course, if you're a defendant, you always want to delay. Of course you uh, do. You want to delay till the end of time. Witnesses may disappear <laughs> and by nefarious means and non-nefarious means. Uh, then uh, memories are, you know, are gone. Uh, circumstances change. Uh, all of those things are problems. So, as your background as a prosecutor kind of came into play a little bit as mayor, in, in a oh, way. Oh, the two. Yeah, I've, yeah, I look yeah. at the two as always having been related. Yeah. How, how's that? I mean, well, they're related in the way that you approach problems. Yeah. I mean, if you have something that's a, a difficulty and you need to overcome it, then uh, you either stick to your guns or. You find something new that says, hey, we've got to do this in a different way, or two, it's got to stop altogether. And uh, if you get a new ruling by the Supreme Court of the United States or by the local courts, uh, and you're forced to follow something that's yet some new hurdle to the prosecution, you're stuck with it. You may not agree with it. You may despise it. You may think it's ill-advised. Many times that's the case. But it's your job to follow the law. So on rail, just going back to rail for a minute, we got to, you're, you're, you, you say, let's finish this job. Let's get it done. Let's just get it over with, move on. You have to. And, okay, we've got some other problems with the city. You okay. think? <laughs> okay, and briefly, briefly, just give me your, your quick answers for a, a couple things. One, homelessness. What are we going to, what do we do? I mean, it's, what is, the, is there a solution or is it? Yeah, get tough. I mean, you have to remember the old days, we didn't have people living like this. Right. Why we've suddenly given these people free reign to sit there and take over parks and lead filth everywhere and uh, make lives uh, frightening for some people, including children, uh, you got to stop it. You know, and whether it means institutionalizing them or incarcerating them or uh, putting some place with a slab in it where they can all sleep behind walls or barbed wire or whatever you want to do. I mean, that's, that, that to my mind makes more sense. You know, we, we had these people years and years ago. I mean, when I was young, they were called uh, hobos if they were on trains, and uh, uh, they were called vagrants. Well, we lost the vagrancy laws, and we lost the, the so, power to control yeah, the public. Yeah, Not the, the public, but public places. There has been that change in the law where they say that you, gotta keep, you can't keep people behind uh, uh, walls of... Uh, Mental institutions anymore. If they don't are not a uh, uh, harm to your, themselves or to the public. And, well, then and that so, depends on how you yeah, yeah. Define, define harm, yeah, right? Yeah, so that's. Yeah. But yes, the answer is correct. If they're uh, if they're a danger to themselves and a danger to society, you can take steps. But uh, if they're somebody who is just sitting around rotting away and urinating all over themselves. Apparently, that's something that we've put up for far too long and far too often. Okay. Now, uh, one thing you mentioned that I, I want to get to before we're pow here is you say you came across the continent. I did. You know, to Hawaii. Uh, what, in your background, made you able to make that transition? What, what, what from New Jersey to uh, North Carolina, right? And and well, the, West Coast, uh, what what the progress had always been to warmer <laughs> weather. Okay, I mean I was in Connecticut in the winter, which was brutal. Uh, then North Carolina was not brutal, but it was uh, it, it was a little chillier. 
uh, and when you get to Los but Angeles. But you got basketball there. So well, the bas that's made all the difference in the world. Okay. And, you know, and I certainly was added a great deal to the North Carolina basketball team. I watched them. <laughs> uh, and uh, then I went to, to uh, Southern California in Los Angeles, and that was uh, another big city, so that was fun. Uh, and then I came out here on a quarter away program and uh, was an intern and decided that this was the place to stay. And it was, uh, so it was a big pleasure. And, 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 you, and you, you, you somehow got into the culture. And the, it, the key was to get me into a job with, uh, uh, in the prosecutor's office. And at that time, uh, when I walked through the door, the prosecutor's office was pretty much in disarray. What had happened was, is that they had stopped uh, grooming people to, it was looked as sort of a stopping place before you can go with the big boys in the private, private sector. Practice, yeah. So it was looked at sort of a way station, and that's the way it was being treated. And that's how, because it was treated like that, that's why we had the problems. So it got turned around uh, almost 180 degrees to what was once lauded as a professional office. Now, one thing, when you were um, mayor, you were advocating for Hawaii to be a, like a center of the Pacific or the, 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 the Asia. Can, how, you know, in the few minutes we have left, what can we do? I mean, is that possible? And what, what oh, did you yeah. learn about it? And yeah, yeah. The, the big thing that happened, I mean, we owe a great debt of gratitude to President Obama, who gave us APEC, which APEC allowed us to, to showcase Hawaii as a serious place to do business. I mean, you could come here and you could uh, be coming from the cold weather and your family can be there and they're all enjoying uh, the pleasures of Hawaii. But the other thing you can do is you can sit in the back room on occasion or get together with uh, the people and you start talking about them about business and you try and cultivate it so that you would have the type of Geneva type atmosphere here in Hawaii uh, at the Geneva of the Pacific which is what we were always uh, aiming for and APEC gave us a really great start into that uh, and a time when we were taken seriously. Is it still possible for us to move in that direction? Well I, in the current present political climate I don't think anybody really knows what's uh, hmm. occurring in Washington DC uh, or other parts of the nation, uh, considering the hostility and the, uh, uh, the unusual actions of some of the players uh, who are involved. Okay, okay. all Is right. Is that politically correct? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll have to get you for another show to get the, 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 the definite <laughs> answer. But let me ask you, just really briefly. Sure. We have about a minute left. How do you deal with victory and defeat. You've been through both, up and down, and prosecutor and mayor. How do you handle those things? You know, uh, you get over it. I, I mean, the, the thing is, is that when you start off as an attorney, uh, you really don't know what you're doing most of the time in terms of pragmatic uh, applications of the law. And uh, so you make mistakes and you get over them and you move forward and you make big mistakes. Move on. Move yeah, on I mean, life. If you're, if you're a, a prosecutor and you've never lost a case, that means you've never, never tried, tried case. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, you know they, they, so you have to get you have to be able to do that and that I think involves whether you're optimistic or pessimistic and I am a perpetual optimist mm. uh, and uh, I'm happy to, to stand up you know brush myself off and go into the battle again and we have to move on right now so our, our program is over this is way thank too you. short <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much i appreciate your time good to, good to see you a pleasure always my friend right. aloha you. aloha